If you're new to cybersecurity, or for some reason you've read the patch notes for any browser before, you've probably heard of the term cross-site scripting, or XSS. Cross-site scripting is a web vulnerability that allows someone to inject JavaScript code into a web application that will run on other users' browsers when they visit a vulnerable website. This injected JavaScript code, called the payload, can be written to do many things for the attacker, including stealing your session cookie to be able to log in as you, spread malware, deface a website to make it look like it was taken over, or even replace the web page with a fake login page to fish for credentials. Cross-site scripting is currently third in the OWASP top 10 web vulnerabilities under injection, and although it cannot directly lead to remote code execution, it is still a dangerous and common vulnerability that can lead to account takeovers and the installation of malware. In this video, I'll show you how to exploit some basic cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and show you the different payloads that we can run to create pop-ups, steal cookies, and deface a website. I'll also cover the three main types of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which are stored, reflective, and DOM-based. But before we get into all that, we need to quickly explain first what JavaScript is. JavaScript is the code on a web page that makes it come to life. It enables a web developer to dynamically load content onto a page, provide real-time updates and interactive elements and animations, and basically it's what turns a web page into a web application. JavaScript has enabled developers to create some pretty interesting things, like this Find the Invisible Cow game, along with many, many more practical things. However, if a website that utilizes JavaScript allows us to input text somewhere on the application, and that text is displayed somewhere on the page, if this input is not properly sanitized, then we may be able to write our own JavaScript onto the web application and have it executed. For example, if we have a form that allows us to post comments, if we input some JavaScript code that makes a pop-up on the page and submit it as a comment, then the web page may execute that JavaScript code, and every time someone looks at your comment, they will get that pop-up. When the cross-site scripting payload is persistent on the web page, likely because it is being saved to a database and fetched by the website, it is called a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. This is the most dangerous type of cross-site scripting vulnerability because the payload has the ability to affect every single user that visits the vulnerable site. So the example we just mentioned where we submit a comment and then that comment is saved to a database and retrieved every time someone visits a web page, if that were vulnerable to a cross-site scripting vulnerability, that would be a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. We can see this in action on the damn vulnerable web application under the cross-site scripting stored page right here. And you can play around with this yourself if you have Metasploitable 2 installed. You just have to visit the IP address of your Metasploitable 2 server slash DVWA and sign in. So here we have a form where we can sign a guestbook where we supply a name and a message. And when we hit sign guestbook, we see that our message gets displayed at the bottom here. And the first thing I like to try when testing for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in a text form is doing the basic script where an alert pops up, basically saying any text that you want. So in this message box right here, we're submitting some JavaScript code, which is noted by the script tags. And inside the script tags, we have an alert that's going to say XSS whenever the page is visited. So let's go ahead and hit sign guestbook. And here's that alert that comes up. And now this has been saved to a database somewhere on the back end and is going to be displayed on the web page every time it's visited. So we can go ahead and refresh the web page. And we see we get the prompt again. It actually just submitted it twice. And we can leave the web page and then go back. And we're going to get the same pop up every single time. Before moving on to our next example, we can clear this from the application by going to setup and then clicking create slash reset database. In a real world scenario, the administrator of the database would have to manually go into the database and remove the malicious input. Otherwise, anyone who visited that page would be uh, affected by that alert. Now, instead of sending an alert with random text, we instead could put document.cookie into our alert function. And this is going to pop up with the cookies that are currently being used by the website. So if we hit sign guestbook, we see we've got two cookies, a security cookie that's set to low, and then our PHP session ID, which is this string right here, which could be used to log in as the user that we're currently signed in as. So running a script that just sends an alert of your own cookies isn't very useful, but a payload that is useful is a script that will take the cookies of whoever visits the web page and sends it to a server that we control. And that's exactly what this payload here does. This document.location variable is set to a web server that we control. It's going to access the index page of that web server. And then we are setting a parameter of C to the document.cookie. Now we can set up a simple PHP web server like so. And now when we submit this payload, uh, anytime someone visits the web page, it's going to access our web server and submit the C parameter with a document.cookie, which should give us their PHP session IDs for whatever account they signed in as. So we see our alert from before, 
and we'll see that every time the page is visited, we see that get request with the C parameter and then the cookies that were sent off as well. So now anytime a user were to visit that page, they'd be sending off their cookies to our attack server. Another thing we can do with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities is manipulate the HTML of the page itself. Here I have some JavaScript code that's going to take the body of the current document and set it to a new page that is going to say hacked in big red text, as well as include an image of a skull and crossbones for dramatic effect. We can change the HTML to whatever we want, but I think this gets the point across. If we try to paste this long script into this message box, we see that it gets cut off because there is a limit on the message size, but this is being checked completely on the front end, so we can modify this by just going to inspect, finding the text box, and then setting the max length to something like 5,000. Now we can paste in our entire script, hit sign guestbook, and now the page looks like this. Where we have hacked at the top and a skull and crossbones image, um, so it makes it look like we took over the entire web server when in reality all we did was abuse a cross-site scripting vulnerability on the web page. If we go back to the home page and then back onto the cross-site scripting stored page, we see that it's persistent and this will display for every single person that tries to visit that web page. Another common form of cross-site scripting is reflective cross-site scripting. This occurs when the payload is not persistent on the web page, meaning that it will disappear when the web page is refreshed or visited normally. This typically occurs when the payload is sent via a get parameter to the web server and then displayed somewhere on the web page. We can see this happening on the DVWA website under the reflective cross-site scripting web page. We can use the same payloads as we did in the stored cross-site scripting page. For example, we'll do the script that sends an alert of our uh, cookie and hit submit. And we see that we get the same alert with our cookies, but this time in the URL of the web page is where we see that our script was reflected. We hit okay. Now, if we were to leave the page and then go back, we notice that the alert doesn't pop up again because it was not saved somewhere on a backend server and retrieved onto the web page. If we just try and send something off like test, we see that the name parameter equals test and we display hello test. Once again, we can send off that payload that makes it look like the web page was hacked, but this really doesn't do anything because anytime a user were to visit the page normally, they wouldn't get that hacked response. So reflective cross-site scripting is typically used by attackers in phishing emails. It will use that session stealing payload that we used earlier to get you to click on the link with that payload in the URL. And this can be more successful than normal phishing emails because the domain of the URL is still the one you're expecting or is one that you deem legitimate and that you trust. But we're still going to be able to abuse the vulnerability on the trusted website to get the session cookies of whoever we're targeting. The last type of cross-site scripting that I will showcase is called DOM-based cross-site scripting. DOM base is entirely client-sided, meaning no request ever has to be made to the web server. This is because DOM-based cross-site scripting occurs when JavaScript is used to change the page source through the document object model. So our user input is handed by some vulnerable JavaScript function that was already loaded into the client. So here is a vulnerable HTML page that I had ChatGPT create for me because I'm too lazy to write one myself. And here we see we have a text box and a button. And when we submit some text into the text box and hit submit, we see that it displays on our web page. We can look at the page source and break it down a little bit. So our input text field has an ID of name input and our button has a property of on click that will run the display input function. And the display input function is going to take the text from our text box and display it directly on our document page as output. And all of this is done completely on the client side. No request is ever made back to the backend web server. This form of cross-site scripting isn't as common and abusable as stored or reflective, but it does exist and it is good to know. If you want to learn more about cross-site scripting and how to exploit it, I would definitely recommend that you check out Hack the Box's cross-site scripting module. It's a great resource for beginners and it will walk you through the three types of cross-site scripting that I showed you earlier, as well as some handy payloads that go way more in depth than what I showed in this video. Alright, that's it for this video on cross-site scripting. If you enjoyed or found this video useful, please leave a like because it helps the channel out a lot, and subscribe if you're new. Leave a comment if you have any questions or there's anything you'd like to share, and make sure to join my Discord to reach out to me and the rest of my community. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.